Good. Great. Well, uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for uh, joining us this month at uh, Data Science DC. We're here to uh, listen to Jason Hughes, and he'll talk about Apache Iceberg, uh, an architectural look under the covers. Uh, if you're here and you realize this is not the meetup that you meant to join, uh, you're still very welcome to stay. Um, but we'll uh, get right on to it. I've got a few announcements first, and then we'll we'll turn it over to the main attraction. Um, for those of you that don't know, um, Data Science DC is just one meetup under an umbrella group called Data Community DC. Um, these are some of our other meetups on the on the left here. Um, so you know, go ahead and join them. We've got Data Visualization DC, Statistical Programming DC. Um, Women and Non-Binary Data Scientists, DC, Night Owls, Data Education, DC, Nova Data Science, Data Wranglers, DC, Full Stack Data Science, DC, and I think we've actually added ML Ops, DC as well, so I need to update this slide. Uh, on the right, uh, you can see links to our social media uh, and our website. Um, we have uh, some additional, I've got some YouTube links in our Slack channel uh, a little later. I'll share them in the chat once I get off the stage. Um, Data Science DC is put on by uh, three people. Uh, I'm Tommy Jones in the middle. Uh, my co-hosts are also Chris Smith and Jeff Hale. I'm not sure Chris is with us tonight, but there's Jeff. Um, you can follow us uh, on uh, Twitter. Our handles are, are there. Um, and if you need to get a hold of us, uh, Jeff is Jeff at datacommunitydc.org. I am Thomas at datacommunitydc.org and Chris is Chris at datacommunitydc.org. Uh, we've got a code of conduct. Um, basically, we want uh, Data Science DC to be an environment that is that is free of harassment. Uh, unfortunately, you know, in the years that we've been doing this, we've had very few incidents, um, but we also have a, a zero tolerance policy on harassment or any harassing behavior. Uh, if you believe that you're being harassed, if you see or hear something that makes you uncomfortable. Uh, since we're all in remote here, I would ask uh, you to give me, uh, which is you know, Data Community DC, a direct message, or Jeff, a direct message. Or you can email us at uh, jeff at datacommunitydc.org or thomas at datacommunitydc.org. Jeff may be in and out, so probably better to stick with me. But um, uh, we will uh, take immediate action if uh, something happens in the in the chat there. Um, we also have a diversity statement. So if we were in the before times when uh, we were all in person, um, this is where I would ask you to look around the room and see the incredible diversity in uh, genders and ethnicities. Uh, if you hang around in the community and you start talking to people, you start hearing a lot of different accents. Um, data scientists are a pretty diverse group. So uh, our pledge to you is that we want um, our speakers throughout uh, the course of the year to uh, reflect the same diversity in the community. Uh, and we ask you as audience members to hold us to that. So again, if you think we are falling short, um, uh, an email or a direct message, and uh, we would love to, to start a conversation. We wanna make sure that we're uh, meeting the, the needs and the expectations of the community here. Um, this meetup is free to you, but it is not free to put on. Uh, so a big thank you to uh, our sponsors here. Uh, they provide us uh, resources for us to buy these Zoom licenses uh, to take care of a lot of our operating costs. It turns out to uh, Data Community DC is a nonprofit. It turns out nonprofits have to pay taxes and hire lawyers and accountants. Um, even if it's uh, a pretty low burn rate, it is still not free. Uh, and in the before times, we, of course, had pizza and empanadas. Um, so a big thank you to uh, the sponsors and uh, check out their products. So I've got a few uh, announcements here. Um, first, in just a couple days on Veterans Day, uh, Data Visualization DC is having their monthly meetup at 6 p.m. Uh, so if you're not a member, go sign up and uh, check it out. And they, they put on a pretty good time. And then just scheduled uh, right before uh, we started here at 12 p.m. on Monday, November 15th, Data Wranglers uh, is uh, doing a presentation on 
uh, airflow. So another big change is that um, starting in 2022, our first meetup, which uh, likely will be January, um, we're planning to go hybrid. So there will be an in-person option for those that are vaccinated and we'll actually be able to, to get to see, to see each other and, and feel like a community again. Um, I will post the link to our YouTube channel and our Slack, but highly encourage you to join. Um, you know, we're recording right now all of these videos. We post them up on YouTube. Uh, join the Slack channel and uh, be able to share jobs, see our job board, share announcements, just hang out with the community, share some data science memes and all of that. Um, so I, le I left the chat on. Um, so here's just my, my prompt for you. If you have any community announcements, meetups you're holding, looking for a job, looking to hire, feel free to drop something into the chat and, and share it with the group. All right, and with that, uh, I am gonna get off the stage and turn it over to Jason. So Jason, I'm gonna stop sharing and then you'll be able to share screen here. Okay, great, thanks, Tommy. So let me go ahead and share my screen here. Um, so, Thanks for, for having me here. Um, you know, we appreciate you guys taking the time um, to go through this presentation. So what we'll be talking about today is really around Apache Iceberg. Um, and Tom, can you just confirm you can see my screen real quick? Confirmed, I can see your screen. Great, thank you. Um, so what we'll be discussing here is really from, you know, we'll be talking about Apache Iceberg. Um, and really what we'll be doing is not just kind of taking it from a higher level but what we'll actually do is go through, first of all, defining kind of what a table format is, because it's kind of a new topic and it's, it's or concept and it's, it's really not, but the term itself and the differentiation, uh, the distinction is. Um, and then we'll talk about really the problems as far as the current state and, you know, really why we ultimately need a new one. And then we'll actually, what we'll do is we should go and really look at the architecture of what an iceberg table like actually looks like, you know, from a lower level um, to understand how it works um further we'll actually take that a step further put it into practice and i should say like all right if i'm going to go do you know create read update delete you know insert uh sql commands um what actually happens right like what actually happens under the covers um and then once we understand that at a low, lower level we'll then bubble that up and see how those details actually affect the the resulting benefits of the iceberg design so um, with that, you know, we'll certainly go through this. I'll go through it a bit fast. This could be a pretty deep topic. I'm um, happy to drill into any areas that you guys are, are interested in, but I know we're, we're fitting this in in about 45 minutes. So we'll go a bit fast and gloss over a little bit. But of course, you know, it's open ended on questions. If you guys do have questions or want me to drill into other areas, certainly happy to do that. So with that, let's jump in. So really, let's talk about what a table format is. Right. And you can kind of look at it in one definition is a way to really organize a data sets files to present them as a single table. Right. And if you think about it, like that's not a new concept. Right. It's been around since system R and Oracle and all these systems implemented a crowds relational model a long time ago. Right. They had to present their tables in their database to users. But ultimately, that was what it ultimately was, was a set of bytes and files right on their disk on their file system and on you know, the disk that they owned and those kinds of things. But they needed to map those things internally. Right. That was just something the storage engine did. Um, but really, what we saw is really in the big data world with really in the first uh, version, really around Hadoop and HDFS, really what this ultimately became was Hive. Right, was that you needed a decoupled way that everyone can agree what a table is called, but then still access one layout the bytes and files on the disk or the storage system, but also allow people to interact with that right in the, in the same way. So that was really the distinction of what we now needed to call kind of a table format. Um, and really with Hive, it, it really was saying that, hey, I have this table, it's called you know table one and database one, uh, and it's composed of one or more directories. Right, it's saying, hey, you have this directory one here, and the contents of this table is just, you know, whatever's in this, um, whatever's in this directory. So let's talk about that a little more. Right, so you have, you know, certainly it's it's either one folder is the simplest model, but of course, I'm sure as we're all aware, at scale, what this really becomes is a set of directories, right, uh, multiple partitions, those kinds of things. But ultimately, the tracking is done at the folder level. Right, you're saying, hey, it's just whatever's in the all of these, you know, 100 partition folders, right. 
Um, and it's really been the de facto standard um, since really, I mean, Hive came out and really since the mass adoption of Hadoop, uh, because Hive was released to really, well, Facebook wrote it, right, to really enable SQL on Hadoop. So you don't have to write these MapReduce jobs. Um, so you could basically democratize and really allow more and more people to access your data, right? Um, so with that, they needed schema and, you know, well, we won't go into the full history there, but, you know, obviously it's been the de facto standard for a long time, right? Um, so there's obviously a, a set of advantages that it really provides and continues to provide, right? And one is that it, it works with basically every engine since the de facto standard, right? There really hasn't been another game in town uh, up until fairly recently, or at least certainly not a widely adopted, right? Um, it provided more efficient access patterns and needing to do full table scans. Like certainly you can, but it provided things like partitioning schemes and mapping that to columns, um, as well as things like bucketing, right? It provided these kinds of things that enabled you to um, not have to do a full table scan for every single query, depending on what the query pattern was, right? Uh, it was file format agnostic. You know, we'll leave that at that for the purpose of time. Um, you, know, you can use it in a file you want. Um, you can atomically update a whole partition Right, so you can actually take a whole partition and how this generally works is that you can say, hey, I wanna take this whole partition of my current day or state or whatever. Um, and I need to change some of the records and I need to delete some, I need to insert some, I need to whatever, right? So what you would do is you could take all that data and you could write it into a new partition. And while you're writing that, nobody sees any changes. And then you atomically swap the reference to that partition in the Metastore, right? This is really where the Metastore comes into this table format as well. Um, and that allowed you to get atomicity, right? And consistency and allows you to get those kinds of things, um, which, which was beneficial. Um, it also provided a single central answer, right? Everyone went to the same Hive Metastore and everyone spoke the same language. So we could all, every engine, every tool, every user got that same answer as of a certain point in time. But there's obviously, uh, you know, it's been around for a long time. It's, it, it was defined as like a, a three bullet points in a white paper. So it's really evolved um to really and it's grown a lot and it's adapted a lot which has been great but there's certainly some cons uh even today to the approach right and one that the smaller updates are really inefficient you can because you can really only atomically update a whole partition well if you only want to change a couple rows you need to do that a lot um that's super inefficient that you need to go do that how much data the out of the whole you're changing as well as how often you're doing it then you get into uh, conflict resolutions and all sorts of things um, there's no way to change data in multiple partitions safely. Like there's no practical way to really do this. If you wanted to insert a row, like a single row in a two different partitions, there's no way you can do that with atomicity guarantees uh, with the Hive format or with even with the Metastore. Like you need like additional layers on top of the application layer uh, to all kind of agree uh, to not do certain things at certain times. Um, same thing with multiple jobs modifying the same data set. Right, like if multiple jobs are doing that, like there's there's an implementation in, in Hive, but because oh, it was so restrictive, Hive is the only one that actually uh, adheres to it, right? And not many people um, are using just Hive today, right? Or even using Hive at all today. So really there's no way you can have multiple engines and multiple jobs modifying the same data set and maintain those guarantees and that trust in the data and uh, that correctness, right? Um, because you're only tracking folders at, in the Metastore, right? Well, engines don't read folders, they read files. So what they need to do is then you need to go figure out which files are in these folders. And at scale, this can take a really long time. Um, like we'll actually go through an example later and we'll go through basically how Netflix, just for a week of their data, it took almost 10 minutes just to do the planning, which most of which was just the listening, right? So at scale, this gets really exacerbated. Uh, users also need to know the physical layout of the table, right? Like if you go, if you have a table partitioned by, you know, year, month, day, which is fairly common, but you're in your table, it's really, it's just a date, right? Or even worse, it's a timestamp. Um, if you go query on that date or timestamp, like you're just going to do a full table scan because the engine doesn't know that there's a mapping and doesn't know that like, oh, you know, today, what he really means in the partitioning scheme is 2021, you know, dash, you know, slash, month equals 11 slash day equals nine, right? Like there, there's no mapping of that. So you end up with really expensive scans and then you need to educate people, um, which at scale, the technology is generally a way better way to solve that problem, right? With software. Um, and Hive table stats are, off, are often stale, if not usually, if not almost always, right? Because it's a really expensive read job. It's, it's something that generally goes, and we see this a lot of organizations is that people end up not collecting nearly as often 
um, and then engines start ignoring it, and then the whole thing just kind of goes out the window, right? Which is a shame because table stats are very effective. Uh, they can be, right, for, for planning queries and just kind of uh, accessing the data in general. So um, really, if we look at how can we actually resolve these issues, right? Um, well, when Netflix really set out, they were having all these problems. And really, I'm sure a lot of people on this call have run into these problems. And these problems really had exacerbated at scale, right? So when, you know, really Netflix was really the first one to kind of, well, not necessarily the first one, but they were the main one to kind of look at it and be like, all right, well, let's take a step back. Is there a way that we can actually solve these problems up? Keep it, keep putting all of these band-aids and band-aids and band-aids on this thing. Like, is it worth it? Are we actually going to end up in the long term? Is should this be the path that we go? Right. So they had some goals that they really wanted to achieve out of their data lake, right? And they're they're kind of overall. In fact, what the you know a lot of people call data lake, they actually call it their data warehouse, right? They actually utilize S3 as their data warehouse, and they they call it that. So they had some goals for that data warehouse. Um, they needed correctness and consistency in their data. Right, they they could they needed that trust in the data, and if two people query the same thing, if you query it whenever, like you're not getting an incomplete picture, right? In order to to be able to make data driven decisions as much as Netflix and every other other organization needs to, you need to have that trust, right? Um, they needed faster query planning and execution. Like I mentioned, we'll go through in a bit. Um, it took them one of their queries on ten minute on ten, excuse me, on a week of data for one metric. Uh, took them ten minutes to plan. So your users are not going to wait that long and they're just going to make guesses or they're at least going to ask far fewer questions or I'm sure as you guys have all experienced, right? That performance is, is key. Uh, Any way you can improve that. Um, really goal is allow users to not have to worry about that physical layout. That example I went again between like date versus what the partitioning scheme is. Like the only way you're going to roll data out to users at more and more scale is if it's simple form, right? You can't rely on educating them or, or certainly you can but around this this is like an easy one that's like all right can we just have the software take care of it right instead of you just getting frustrated and taking forever just to do a simple query on like one day of data because you don't know what it's partitioned like you, users should not have to worry about that right um they had a lot of problems with table evolution right like uh, obviously with netflix and i'm sure as we've all seen right like tables just grow over time and like for them, I'm sure a lot of you guys have the tables that have been around for a very long time, right? And those tables evolve in different requirements and different scales and different schemas and different provisioning schemes. And like all those things, the all, the only constant is change, right? So like, let's just embrace that and let's actually make sure that we're ready and that we can change that effectively. Um, and what they really needed to do was accomplish all these things at scale. Like on any of these things, it's like, okay, yeah, I can do that on one node, right? It's like, well, what about when my table's five petabytes, right? Like that's really what they need to do. And especially in the future, right? They didn't want to have to put band-aids on this thing. They wanted this thing to be able to, to grow and grow and grow with them, right? And, you know, one year, 10 years, 20 years. So what they figured out in what they kind of, when they were taking a step back and looking at all these band-aids and what they really realized is all those cons that we went through were really a result. And the way they can achieve these goals is actually through a pretty simple or at least a straightforward and elegant kind of solution to this. And it's really, instead of tracking things at the folder level, well, let's track them at the file level. So what you can do is, again, you can, what we'll go through is how you can really mitigate those cons and address these requirements with that pretty straightforward change, right? Obviously it's more complicated than that, which we'll go through, um, but that's the core um, insight that that's the main difference. Um, it's really saying, hey, I have these files, I'm not tracking directories. It's saying, hey, it's this and it's a canonical list of files. Right, you go to a single place, and this is the files that are in this table. So, because Hive is a pretty nebulous thing, and I'm sure if you asked, you know, maybe everyone in this group, what is Hive and or what is in Hive and what isn't in Hive, you would probably at least get quite a few answers. Um, let's talk about what Iceberg is and what it isn't. Right, it is a table format specification. It's a way to lay out bytes to form a table. Right, that abstraction. Um, it's also a set of APIs and libraries for interacting with that specification, right? It's not a storage engine, it's not an execution engine, and it's not a service, right? Any interactions and things that happen with an iceberg table are these kinds of engines. An execution engine is probably the mo most common one that leverages these libraries that interact with these APIs, right? So just, just be, you know, be to be really clear about that. So you can see on the left here, the high level architecture of an iceberg table, 
Um, and we'll actually walk through all of these. So we'll actually walk through from the top to the bottom an explanation on what all of them are, as well as a kind of summary of, hey, what happens when a query actually reads data? Because it kind of lends itself very well to that understanding of that direct applicability. So um, the first thing here is the iceberg catalog. So the iceberg catalog is really a store that houses like, and it's basically like, hey, what's the current state of the table? That's effectively what the catalog is. Um, and it basically stores that reference. And really the key here is that you wanna store as much as you can in the data lake, right? Cause basically it's scalable and you get all these benefits like immutability and therefore you can do certain things. But at the end of the day, you still need some sort of locking mechanism or something to provide that, uh, that atomicity and that strong consistency um, that many data lakes or you know, cloud data lakes like S3 don't provide for most operations. So what you see here is we have the iceberg catalog and really the key requirement for that thing, and there's a bunch of different implementations of it that are possible. Again, it's an API, so it's anything that implements those APIs and, and guarantees can be, it, it can be a catalog. Um, it's really around supporting those atomic operations for updating that pointer. They say, hey, what's the current state of the file? So certainly you can do HDFS. Um, Hive Metastore is probably, a, probably the most common one currently. Um, and that's really just leveraging Hive Metastore just for storing that pointer right? Not the full table format, um, as well as Project Nessie. Those are probably three of the more common ones. There's also things around glue. There's a generic JDBC one. Um, but again, it's really just anything we can store that and make uh, atomic operations to update that point. Um, and we can see what it contains is really that mapping of the name to the location, right? That current metadata pointer um, basically says like, hey, you come in as a query, right? And you go to the catalog and then you say, hey, I want, I needed to go do a select star with a limit, let's say, uh, on db1.table1, right? So you go to the catalog and you go say, hey, this is what I need. And the catalog is going to give you, here's the location of the current metadata file, right? So what you do is you go on your way and you say, okay, now I have the location of that metadata file. I'm going to go read that metadata file. So uh, what we do is a metadata file, which as it's named, uh, basically stores metadata about a table as of a certain point in time. Uh, so you can see the various contents here. This is obviously an excerpt. This is not the full file. You see some of the things that it stores, right, at this kind of top level. Um, so what we're going to go do is one of the key things here is that it actually stores snapshot information in reference to manifest lists, right? So we have a set of snapshots from the changes that we've made. Um, and what we're going to go do as a reader, we're going to go say, hey, what's the current snapshot ID? All right, it's going to get that. And then it's going to look up in this array and it's going to go get, all right, let me get the snapshot ID here. Here's the manifest list. And I'm going to go, now I have the location of this file, right, of this path. So um, now what we're going to go do is we're going to go read that manifest list. And as it's named again, it's a list of manifest files. Um, basically, you can see here, basically we're getting down to the data files. You can see it's a list and you see various pieces of information about that manifest file, right? Um, you see the kind of like, you know, when it was added, what the partition spec is, um, the partition that it's part of, um, we won't get into that as far as full details of the specs, but um, you can see at this point, you can start doing partition printing, right? Uh, you don't need to wait to, to get to the, to the end, uh, the, the actual storage itself, or the data itself, rather. Um, so now you have the manifest lists, and now you have a set of manifest files. So what you're going to go do is go read one of the manifest files. Right. And again, we're doing a select star with a limit in this query. So it's, we don't need all of them. Um, and this manifest file basically keeps track of the data files. Right. This is actually what keeps track. You know, we say like a, a table is a list of files. This is at the root level, or sorry, the leaf level, as far as like what's actually keeping track of those files. So you can see here various details about the data files. Right. And there's going to be multiple of these within a manifest file. You know, many is, is going to be more common. Uh, but you see the kind of details that are in this. Right. Certainly the path, file format. You know, again, it's file format agnostic. Um, and then you see some stats, right? You can say that, hey, for this one, you have the lower bounds, the upper bounds, how so many values for, you know, for each column. Um, so as a query, there's a select star with a limit. Now you're going to say, okay, cool. I'm going to go grab one of those files. And now I can return back to the client, right? Uh, <laughs> excuse me. So this may seem like a lot um, as far as the steps that it does, but we'll actually show you in a bit here how it's way, way faster and is actually really fast um, at, at runtime. So let's actually go through a couple examples. Like let's actually look under the covers when we do some actual changes to a table, right? So step one, let's create a table. We'll go ahead and run this create table statement. Um, as you can see currently, there's nothing, 
right? But when we go actually execute this create table, you'll see here on the right, it's going to be tracking the, the diagram that we've been showing, right? It's kind of the different types of files and everything like that. On the left, you'll see the catalog as well as the actual file system structure of what it actually looks like, right? So we created this table. Here's the four columns that we have. With this, we have this order timestamp. Um, we actually partitioned by the hour of that order timestamp. So more on that in a bit, but you can see that it's partitioned by a reference, by a transformation of an existing column, right? It's not some new column that we've defined. So we've created that table. We created an edited file. It had the schema, has all the details, um, but we haven't created any data yet, right? All we've done is create the table. Um, so now what we'll do is we'll go ahead and insert some data. So I haven't run this yet. Well, it's like, you know, we'll insert some data again for the purpose of time and example. This is just literals, right? So we can see now when we go actually execute that statement, you can see that now we have data, right? And we have the rest of these kinds of things. And what actually happened was that whatever engine that we executed this in, right, went and first wrote a data file, right? It knew it had to write a parquet file with these contents, one row. Um, but it created the data file, then it knew the information about that, right? The stats, the minimum, low, low, the upper bounds, lower bounds, null value counts, all that kind of stuff, the partition it was in. So it created a manifest file with those details, right? Then it created the manifest file and wrote that out to the data lake. Uh, you can see that here, right? And then with that, it created the manifest list, right? Because it had all the information it needs. And then once it does that, it's actually going to go take the, you know, the V1, the original metadata file, read that, and then make the changes and append to say, hey, I have these new changes that I just made, right? So we still have this, what we'll call, you know, snapshot, which is snapshot zero, which is the same thing from here, which is there was no data in the table, but I still have my schema and I still have my partitioning scheme and everything. Um, but now I have S1, which is a different version of the table, which says, hey, here's the contents of this table, right? And then the catalog get updated the reference to say, hey, the new metadata file is now v2 metadata.json. It's not v1 anymore, right? So now we have this as the current state. So let's say that we loaded some data into a stage table and we want to do an upsert, right? We want to do a merge into. Um, so let's say that what we're going to do is we're going to do that. We're going to look at order IDs. And when we already have the order ID, we're actually just going to update the order amount. And when not, we're going to do an insert. So um, we're going to go ahead and run this. And let's say that there's some, you know, there's a couple rows in the original table that or, you know, there's the one row that is there that exists that we're going to update. And then there's another one that doesn't exist in the original table or the master table that we're going to insert. So we go ahead and run that and you can see the changes that were made, right? Again, same exact flow that the original, that this previous writer went through. Data files and then up through the stack, right? But you can see here now that we have, you know, the data, we have two different partitions. And you can see here that with this original data file that we created, like it's still there, but we actually have written a new version of it. We read the original and then we had to update that order amount because we uh, it was the same order ID, wrote that. And then we also had this new, um, we had this new order as well that was actually in a different partition, right? It was the next day, uh, two hours later. And again, it was the same state. So now the, the catalog says V3, right? Which points to this path. So now let's go through um, the situation where you want to read the data and some user is just like, hey, give me the uh, orders from, you know, January 26th, right? Like as a user, that's a pretty reasonable ask, right? So uh, it's what you would happen in a hive table, right? Is it would say, well, I'm not partitioned by day. I'm actually partitioned by hour. And in fact, in, in hive, it would probably be 2021 slash one slash two six slash eight. Right, and you would end up having to read the whole table, which at scale becomes, I'm sure as we all know, a big problem. So let's see what happens with Iceberg. Basically what happens is that we'll go through the same paths as we showed before, right? Go to the catalog, get the current metadata pointer, go to that file, hey, I want the current version, go to this manifest list, go to this manifest file. And then within this manifest file, it actually has the references as we saw with like the partition spec, of like, hey, it's these partitions, right? And within that, Iceberg actually has the references and say, hey, it's partitioned by this field, but this field is actually an hour transform on this timestamp field. So the engine can then say, oh, okay, cool. Well, I know that if it, they're asking for date, what I can effectively is the equivalent thing is saying, well, give me all partitions where it's this date at zero through this date at 23, right? So it can go and do that. And then it can all knows it only has to scan this one partition. It doesn't need to scan any other partitions. So that's how it really, that key is storing that reference of the transform. So 
Um, let's do another example here where we're actually going to look at, you know, a lot of a common use case here is like snapshotting, right? Around like end of week, end of month, end of quarter, right? End of year for like a lot of financial reporting, we need to keep that, right? Um, and that can provide, well, and it can be issues with like locks and coordinating at the application level of what job they're writing. Uh, then you need to keep that around and which one do I use when? Um, but really what you can do with Iceberg is, well, let's abstract that physical complications. So let's just allow well, users to operate in that logical world, right? So you can just say, all right, well, give me the select star from this table as of, you know, the, this date, this daytime, right? And let's just call it, again, this is <laughs> obviously not current, but the timestamp is from before we did that merge into, right? After we did the insert, before we did the upsert. So what um, basically the engine that's going and accessing Iceberg is going to do is going to go through the same path, right? Catalog, current metadata pointer. It's going to go to the metadata file. And then it's going to know, hey, the user is actually ask, asking, asking for the data as of this date time. So it's going to go, as you saw in that array of kind of snapshot IDs and when it was added in those details, um, what was the current snapshot as of that timestamp, right? So it's going to be able to find that out. And it's going to know that was actually S1. So what we can do is, all right, now S1, now we're going to go read the manifest list that corresponds to S1, and then we're going to go through the exact same path, right? So it's the same as a read, but we're just doing a bit of a hop right here because we know the user wants something slightly different. And now we're actually going to go access this file that's not active, but it's still there, right? Um, because we, we wanted it to be there to allow to do things like this, right? Obviously, you can figure in and have it clean up if you want. So um, obviously, as you saw, that's, you know, it, it's quite, a, it, it's a, quite a few steps, right? Not to say that the high read path isn't definitely some steps as well, but it's, it's I think it's probably, it's fewer steps, right? But like, let's look at what this actually looks like, right? At scale and in production. So this is actually a slide straight from Netflix from Ryan Blue, who's, uh, you know, basically the co-creator of, of Iceberg. Um, and this is straight from a presentation that he's done a couple of times um, on Iceberg. And if you look at it, it's basically their time series metrics from some of their, you know, their operational systems. And one month, just one month of data is, you know, almost 3 million files and 2,700 partitions. And really they have a problem where they really can't process more than a few days of data. So even let's look at this query, right? We want to get the distinct, um, you know, there's some field called type within the field of tags. Um, and they really want to look at a single metric and they only want to look at a week, right? Fairly straightforward query. So with Hive, that same, that, that exact query took them almost 10 minutes to just plan the query, right? Just to do an explain. So that doesn't even count any execution. That's just getting the files and then planning the query. And the vast majority of this time was actually spent just getting the files um, for, for, to then execute, right? But this doesn't even include execution. So if we look at Iceberg, with just basic partition data filtering, we can see that uh, the execution time is about 13 minutes, but the actual planning time was 10 seconds. So from 10 minutes planning time to 10 seconds planning time, right? Like that's pretty incredible. That's a 60 X improvement, right? Um, and your data hasn't changed. Um, but if we actually take into account that min and max filtering as well, which we saw in those stats, which are in the manifest list and manifest files, we can see that it actually took us even down further from 13 minutes to 42 seconds. So full execution now, whereas planning alone, so just the planning part of Hive was 10 minutes. Now to Iceberg with planning and execution takes 42 seconds, the exact same query, right? So your user's not changing anything. Um, like that, that's pretty incredible. So um, one of the other keys that's enabled by this design that's kind of hinted at in that previous slide is actually the ability to do compaction, right? It's a long known problem um, in Hadoop really big data um, of the small, small files problem, right? Um, and that's really that your writers and even your reader to a certain extent want fresh data, right? And you just want to get a row, write a row, right? Um, but the problem is that the, the fixed overhead on that, both on the right side and the file, as well as the tracking of it, um, is way outweighed um, by basically by doing that with a small variable cost versus what you really want is to do the higher variable cost of basically writing a lot of data. So your overhead is relatively small, right? Um, but so basically what, what compaction allows you to do is balance the right side and read side trade-offs. So basically what you can do is on the right side, right? When you're writing data, you can write that more and more often, right? And it's okay if you create some small files. Um, but what Iceberg allows you to do is basically say, yeah, go ahead and write the small files. But what I'm going to do, and really what Iceberg API is going to enable, um, another engine will actually do the work, is to compact those, you know, 100 
small files into one large file. So then on the read side, you have that high throughput that you can actually read that really fast, right? So you can get that throughput to improve your, your read performance for your, for your scans. Um, one thing, that, and this is really, and this happens asynchronously in the background, right? So your users aren't impacted by this at all, right? Versus Hive, where you have to do it at the partition level, um, and that can get really tricky, especially as you're making updates. Like you can do one or, you know, you can do compaction, or you can do updates, and really even then you can only do updates to a single partition and by a single job, right? Um, what Iceberg allows you to do is not have to worry about any of that. Right, even on just the compaction side, it really allows you to um, provide this asynchronously, so your users aren't impacted. They just a so they see the data fresh, they see the data quickly, right? But b they also get the other side of that trade off and get the high throughput reads, right? They actually get the performance that they need on the right side as well. Um, so one thing to note is that because Iceberg is a, a set of APIs and libraries, it is not an engine. Um, this scheduling slash triggering, right, depending on what you want to do, uh, and the actual compaction work is done by external tools, right? Um, so Iceberg enables it, but you need external tools to actually do these things um, by design, the, the, how they designed Iceberg. They didn't want to boil the ocean and have it do everything to ev be everything to everyone. Um, so you can do it, you know, a schedule work for a workflow, workflow tool at the end of certain jobs, something watching like, hey, when I hit a threshold of X percent of my data is in, you know, small files or, or however you want to define it, or every day or every week, right? Or not every week, probably. Um, every day, every couple hours, whatever. Um, and then it will actually, another engine will actually do the work, right? Some sort of processing engine, whether it's Spark or Dremio or whatever, right? Will actually do the compaction and take, read those small files, um, and actually do it as a write job back in the iceberg table. And really compaction is just a special type of a write job, which we saw is do the inserts, right? It goes the exact same uh, path. So now let's talk about the benefits, right? Like now we kind of understand what we've been talking about at the lower level. Let's talk, let's kind of level this up and say, all right, let's apply these things to the actual value that is gained. So one of the main things is that you can efficiently make smaller updates, right? You're not making the changes at the partition level anymore. You're not making changes at the file level, right? And files only get so big. Like generally 128 meg is, is the recommended amount, maybe 256 meg, right? Um, so you can make those changes much more efficiently, right? And therefore you can make a lot more changes effectively. Uh, you also get snapshot isolation for transactions. And really what that allows you to do is outside of, you know, obviously snapshot isolation, uh, your, your reads and writes don't interfere, don't interfere with each other. So one, as you're writing, your reads aren't effective. As you're reading, your writes aren't affected. Um, and all your writes are atomic. So you actually don't have the issue where, you know, you can see part of a write, right? Like either you see it all or you see none of it, right? It's really that transaction ability. Uh, and it also gives you concurrent writes. Multiple people can actually be writing at the same table at once. Um, and basically what it does is it uses optimistic concurrency control and with some checks, basically, you know, the right, uh, not to go into depth, but it's basically like, hey, I'm about to go modify these files as long as these files still exist, I'm good, right? And a table of, you know, 2.7 million files for, you know, seven days, which we saw there, or a month, I think it was, um, that that can be really fine-grained there. Uh, it also enables faster planning and execution. Really the key here is that the, the list of files is actually defined on the right side. Right. As far as like OLAP analytics goes, it's very much a write once, read many kind of style. Right. So it's like, well, why are we paying this cost to list these files and all these the collecting stats, which we'll talk about in a minute? Why are we doing all of these things on the read side when we do the read side like a hundred or a thousand times more than the right side? Right. Um, so it's basically like, all right, well, let's define those list of files on the right side. So the read side gets that benefit. Right. Let's take that cost and shift it. Um, same thing with the stats, all right? Instead of doing one expensive read job, well, the thing writing the file already knows about what the details of the data is, right? Or it's very easy for it to get it if it doesn't already officially know it. Um, so let's do it on the right side, right? It'd be, well, why wouldn't we? Um, and also because of that also gives you reliable metrics, right? But instead of doing that really expensive and frequent job, especially on-prem is where this really becomes uh, like, you know, almost non-existent, um, if not rare, um, is where you can do this on the right side instead, right? As we, for the same reason we went over before. Um, and really this benefits all of your cost-based optimizers, right? Now any query that you issue, especially at scale, now has the right join order, right? It's a huge one um, to really enable you to do these kinds of things. Another key is really to abstract that physical view and expose a logical view, 
right? With that hidden partitioning, which is the, the term for what we went through where you partitioned by the hour of an event timestamp and a user asked for it for a single day. And we were like, oh yeah, no, we know they mean this hour range, right? Being able to store that relationship and that transformation um, to really enable you to expose that logical view um, as well as with compaction, right? So you don't need to, you know, users don't need to know about it. They get the benefits on the right side of seeing data quickly and fresh, but that's only like, a percent or two percent of your data that's in that maybe even a row format with Avro, right? What you can do is compact that or, you know, Parquet or whatever, even small files. Um, what you can do is compact that into larger Parquet files uh, and they don't have to know about it. They don't have to worry about it, right? Um, what that also means is that tables can change over time. Uh, we didn't really go through it in this for the purpose of time, but there's full evolution support built into Iceberg. There's schema evolution, which is very transparent. Um, which like with Hive, it's actually dependent on the file type, which is interesting. Uh, if you make the same change uh, to a table, which is like CSV versus Parquet versus I think Avro, and I think even ORC, uh, they all get handled slightly differently. Um, you know, not just the change, but also like what happens if you change back or, or you know, in the future, like that gets real complicated. Um, so it allows you for schema evolution, partition evolution, even coexistence of two different partitioning schemes. It really allow you that flexibility um, to, not have to worry about it, right? Um, what this also means is that data engineering can transparently experiment with that table layout, right? Um, so you can actually run experiments to be like, hey, yeah, I think this, um, and you can actually see what that looks like. Um, this is kind of a, a lower benefit, but certainly that's something you can do with that ability. Um, schema evolution support, which you talked a bit about, um, all engines really see those changes immediately. Because you don't have to do those listings and therefore a lot of systems will cache the file listings because they can't spend 10 minutes listing files, <laughs> um, is that all engines will see those changes immediately, right? Because it's a very lightweight operation. Now they're gonna go to the catalog and as soon as something changes, every engine that's querying that as of that point in time is gonna see those new changes, right? There's no wait for anyone. Uh, it also, Iceberg actually provides the ability for event listeners as well. So if you kind of think about what like use cases like triggers in a database served, uh, it's kind of similar here, but you can kind of expand it as the broader view as far as like, they're just APIs. So you can do that in anything. You're not limited to what the database supports or what, you know, even SQL or even the UDFs or anything like that. Like you can do arbitrary things with these things, right? Because they're just eventless. Um, and certainly that's one around like, all right, well you have downstream performance um, performance derived copies, right? Like caches and materialized views and that kind of stuff. You can know exactly what changed and therefore you can, you know, when it changed. So you can keep those things up to date really well. Um, you can also do incremental processing, right? Cause you know, again, you know exactly what changed. You have the, what got added, what got removed. Um, so you can do incremental processing there too. Um, as well as around the future and, you know, pluggability of this thing. Like we don't even know, you know, in the future what, you know, kind of event listeners and perhaps even a marketplace will be out there, right? For things that you can do and, and leverage around the functions and libraries and, and those kinds of things. So um, here's some additional resources here. You can see um, you know, a few different websites here. Um, you know, certainly the Apache site uh, for Iceberg. Uh, we have a, at Dremio, we have a, uh, we, we have a, we have a website for Apache Iceberg as well. And the way you can actually get hands-on on Iceberg's uh, getting started page. So you can actually go there and you know, work with engines and actually get your hands-on as well uh, to do more than just the examples that I went through here. Um, so I see we have quite a few questions. Let me go through these. I can I can read them off to you if you want, or if you want to. Uh, um, I can probably it's, it's probably easiest if I go through them because I'm wondering if I maybe addressed any of them. You know, they asked early in the presentation, I ended up addressing them. I'm hoping. <laughs> um, uh, Iceberg slash hoodie slash. Uh, I think that means Delta Lake. Uh, which, when, why? <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting topic. Um, it's a deeper topic than to go in here fully, uh, spend time, but at a high level, hoodie is pretty good at like time series, like changes. Um, and it's actually at like, it's within the file itself. Um, so it's, it's pretty good at that, but it was never, you know, if you look at where it came from, like Uber made it to, uh, to work with their time series changes. It was never meant as like a general purpose table format for all of their data. Right, where if you look at like the kind of things that like Iceberg was able to do with like, hey, what about planning and execution and table evolution and compaction and like all these things that it was never in the design for Hoodie to begin with, right? Not to say that like Hoodie, you know, works for quite a few people. And if that's what you're doing is mainly event streams and those kind of updates, then yeah, it can work fine for you. 
right? Um, but Iceberg can too. And then with Delta Lake, um, it tr tries, Delta Lake is closer to Iceberg as far as um, the, the positioning and the technology. Um, and it can do a lot of the similar things, right? The transaction guarantees, um, those, those kinds of things. Uh, there's a couple key differences. One of which is that Delta Lake is kind of open source. Um, like a lot of it is, but in practice, when you actually use the thing with like Databricks, it's actually not the open source implementation. Um, and what that really means, one of the core areas, a couple examples, but one of the core areas is that you can't do with the open source version, you can't have concurrent writers safely. Like you can, but you're going to be overwriting each other, right? It's basically going to be last write wins and therefore you're going to have data loss, right? So that's really, it's, it's kind of open source and they don't talk about it being open source, but in practice, like rubber meets the road, it's not where it, it's not open source where it needs to be. Um, is one of the, the the key differences there. And there's some other things around, like you got to do checkpoints every 10 commits by default um, instead of doing it you know, asynchronously. So now every one out of every 10 of your writes is slower than the other ones. Um, so it has some, some quirks around that and only supports Parquet. It doesn't support other file formats. Like there's some other differences there um, as well. Um, okay, looks like that was one from the community announcement. Um, on what basis a meta manifest file will be created. I, I hope we, uh, Sarah Bond and I, I hope we went through and, and you understood that from, I think it was probably earlier in it. Um, but let me know if not, as far as, you know, on the right side, you write the data file. And then with that information, you then use that to write the manifest file and then use that to further go up the stack. Um, Saranya asked if billions of records are inserted into a table. I assume many parquet files will be created. Is there any way to control the size of the output parquet files? Um, yes. And this um, is a distinction here where Iceberg is not doing the writing. It's actually that processing engine. So whatever you're using, Spark, Dremio, you know, whatever, um, is actually doing the writing of that data. That's actually where you configure it. Um, Iceberg isn't controlling and being like, hey, I need this size or whatever. Um, it's agnostic to that. It's, it's file format agnostic, in fact. Um, so you just use the general, the defaults and best practices, right? 128 meg is, as far as road groups go, um, usually the default, maybe of one, maybe two, maybe three uh, road groups per file. Um, but yeah, it's, it's general best practices that have been around forever for that. Um, it's not, uh, Iceberg doesn't change those best practices. Uh, the one thing that it does allow you to do is if you want to write smaller parquet files, um, then it allows you to do that freely and safely because then downstream, you don't have the the down the downsides of writing those small, small files because you have compaction to help you later, right? So it gives you that, it, it doesn't, if anything, it, it says, okay, you can use the same best practices if you want, but it actually allows you to stray a little bit further from the best practice or at least more down that trade-off of latency versus throughput, right? It allows you to sit more of where you want on that, um, especially if you want a better freshness, slower latency data availability. Um, is there a daemon runs for Iceberg? If so, where, where does the API hit? Um, yeah, so it's a, yeah, so it's a good question. So Iceberg is not a daemon that, that is running anywhere. So basically what you'll have is um, basically there's Iceberg libraries that basically take control of like when you say um, like, hey, I need to go write this file, right? Or I need to go like update this record, right? There's a set of core APIs that every engine is going to call. And then the libraries actually implement those APIs. So then it knows like, all right, I'm going to go write this over here. And I know that that's going to be interacting with the standard and the specification. Uh, then that it'll be safe and that everyone's speaking the same language, right? So everyone did their own thing. Um, no one would see the right table, <laughs> right? Hopefully that answers your question. Um, ah, looks like yes. Uh, yeah, apply to that. Cool. Uh, I understand deep level of granularity. I understand deep level of granularity is attained on how we design the partitions. Does it extend to bucketing as well? Um, so the short answer is um, yes, at a high level. Um, like around bucketing and really, I mean, I've kind of started, but really it's around like, all right, how do I co-locate like the maps out of my joints, right? And how do I do these kind of, um, do these kind of more efficient joints? Um, there's, I don't know if it's made it into the spec yet, but it's absolutely something that the, the iceberg community is looking at and implementing is that like, how do you make like fact to fact joins more efficient? Right. And I think a lot of people used hive bucketing for like the hive acid properties, because that was the only way you could do it because it didn't lock in that way. Um, but really one of the big benefits was doing that, you know, kind of fact to fact joint. And that's one thing that Iceberg really tries to, is gonna basically addresses as well, 
Um, and there's a lot of stuff in the community too, right? Not just bucketing, but like, all right, well, what about like secondary indexes, right? So there's even that kind of stuff in the discussion around the community as well. Um, and again, like one of the big, actually going back to Delta Lake thing, um, Iceberg is fully open. It's not just open source. It's actually governed by Apache. Like it's an Apache project. Um, so there's all sorts of governance and rules that goes around that to make sure that it's community driven, right? So for instance, that thing like secondary index is like the community was like, hey, like we need something like this, right? Uh, so there was a proposal that was made and it's gone back and forth a few revisions and then it's made its way. I don't know if it has yet, but it's that or very close uh, to making it in the spec and therefore then the APIs and the different integrations um, as well. Right. And that's something that uh, is really powerful. And it means that no, it's not controlled by any vendor, right? Like Netflix created it, but they don't own it. Um, and in fact, a lot of companies like Apple is a heavy user of it uh, and they contribute a lot to it. Um, also companies like Airbnb, Expedia, Amazon, like all these companies contribute to it. And you know that no one of them owns it. And it's the community together that really drives it. Right. Versus Delta Lake, which like Databricks owns outright. Right? Like they say it's open source, but it's the same way it's open source as like, uh, I don't know if that's a great example, but like something like Impala, right? Like technically it was open source, but like for all the reasons that matter, it effectively wasn't. Um, because, you know, as far as a community and not being owned and the, the direction of it and like taking uh, commits and improvements from other people, like it, it wasn't any of those things. Um, and that's really what Delta Lake is as well. And it's, <laughs> Delta Lake isn't even fully open source, right? It's for the reasons I mentioned earlier. Um, how does the file layout look like? Do the data files co-reside? Um, so the important thing, so it's an important distinction there is that the data files, and if I go back to this, oh, this is all built, sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, let me go way far back and basically talk about the three layers, right? So here, actually, let's go all the way back to here. Um, you can see here that the three layers, you have the metadata, you have the catalog, you have the metadata layer, and then you have the data layer. Right, the data layer, pretty clear. Um, but the actual metadata layer and the data layer are both stored in your data lake. All right, so that's uh, more commonly is cloud object storage, like S3, ADLS, GCS, whatever. Um, but also could be like HDFS, right? But this is basically data lake data storage. Um, so that's where, what that looks like, you know, when like, what does the file layout look like? It's like, well, it look, kind of looks like what we talked about there with like paths, but physically it's, you know, distributed across the different nodes. But logically, it's basically your data lake storage is what these, these file paths are. And you had meta slash metadata, right? So you have all these files, uh, those could be stored on any different node, right? That's not, the, the, the where it's stored is less important as far as where the logical access point is, right? And that's where that file path is. Um, how do concurrent rights handle conflicts? Databases uses locks to handle this. Yeah, uh, so it's a good question. It basically utilizes optimistic concurrency control is the short answer. Um, and basically what that means is that Let's say both of us were operating on some table with 10 files, right? And I want to go update file one, right? While I'm doing that, I need to go insert some records into this thing. And really it's the rows within the records that I need to do and it's older data or it's, you know, an hour old or whatever. Um, and while I'm making those changes, you come in and you start your transaction and you say, hey, I need to go update some recent records, right? Like these things changed. Um, so you modify files nine and 10, right? It's cool, you do your commit. And now anyone reading that while I'm still doing my changes, anyone reading that file now sees, or reading that table now sees files nine and 10 changed, right? But they still see original version of one. So now they see your changes because you already did your commit, right? But I haven't yet. Uh, and then as soon as I do my commit, like the, what, when I started, the table does not look like, does not look the same as it currently does, right? So what I need to do is say like, hey, well, what changed? Basically, I can go look at what changed because I know when I started and I know, therefore, all of the commits that have happened since then. And therefore, I can look at all the files that have changed. And I know that file one didn't change. Files nine and 10 changed. So what I can do is say, okay, this is the new file one. I can go get the commit that you just did. And I can say, okay, we got the new file nine, new file 10. We also have this new file one. And then I'm going to commit with that. So that's basically how it's going to hand, that's basically going to do optimistic concurrency control. And then specific around conflicts, like if you had modified file one while I was modifying file one, it would basically reject my commit. It would say, nope, sorry, when you started, um, that file that you were working on file one has actually changed and it has been committed since you started writing. So 
I'm going to, you know, basically you can't commit. So then I would basically have to go retry my operation and then I would need to go do it against, again, against the new file one. And then hopefully optimistically, I would be able to commit. Um, hopefully that answers again, please feel to follow up on any of these questions. If my answer doesn't fully address what you're getting at, I want to make sure that, that we get those addressed. Uh, what are the advantages, uh, downsides of Delta Lake? And we talked about that one. Uh, what are the out of the box engines that support iceberg? Um, so yeah, out of the, uh, out of the box. So engines that support iceberg are, you have more on the ETL side as you kind of have two categories of engines. One is really on the ETL side or kind of three. Um, well, let's simplify it to two. Um, ETL, ingestion and ETL, um, which is really the main engines there uh, that currently support it are uh, Spark and Flink are the main two. Um, I believe there's probably some work more around glue and stuff like that that's coming around their, their abilities because they've been heavily involved in the iceberg and, and contributions and stuff. Um, I believe, a th and then on the query processing side, right? So more of like the user facing query processing side, um, the, um, Dremio supports it, um, Athena supports it, I believe, uh, Presto slash Trino slash whatever, uh, supports it as well. Um, so those are the main ones. If you can actually go on, uh, Apache's website and you can always see the current up-to-date list of the different engines that support Iceberg. Um, but those are the main ones. Um, but that's not to say, you know, if there's an engine on that list or that you, or you, that you use that isn't on that list, again, it's fully open source. Um, so you can go implement integration if, if you want. Um, that, that's fully something that you can do. The spec is fully open source if you wanted to go uh, implement that. Um, within a partition, if data files co-reside, then we may still see S3, S3 throttling. Whereas if we don't want, then we may not hit throttling while writing or reading. Um, yes, I think what you're getting at is kind of the, um, yeah, the, the prefix uh, nature of S3. And that's actually something that, um, that's actually something that I glossed over for the purpose of time and simplicity. But yes, that actually is one of the big things that um, Netflix is actually seeing as well is that it's funny, the Hive table format, which is, you know, uh, path to the database, you know, whatever path you got there, slash table slash partition scheme, right? So it's just like column one equals X, column two equals Y, right? And then you got all your files and then a partition. Well, generally you're doing full partition scans, right? Because the highest level of pruning is generally at a partition, maybe bucketing, but even then you're still using that same S3 prefix, right? Which is the way S3 generally handles like sharding of really the, the like load balancing and how much bandwidth and, and number of requests that you could provide. Uh, so the actual, it's funny that the Hive table format is actually at complete odds with how S3 recommends you architect it, right? Um, they say just as many prefix as you can, you really want to spread out your writes or your reads really and writes, um, but you really want to do that as many prefixes as possible. Um, and the Hive table format basically says the opposite, like let's put it on, them all on the exact same prefix. Um, so it's actually one of the keys that Netflix does. So I simplified a bit of my, my diagram there, but you're exactly right, is that it actually will spread out those files even within a single partition to um, different prefixes. So again, simplify for that nature, but that's absolutely something that Netflix saw, which is something you really see at scale, right? You may not see it at a lower scale, but as you grow and as you grow and get more data um, and more requests, more queries, you'll, you'll absolutely start to see that. So that's something that Iceberg actually addresses as well. Um, again, that was one of the goals of Netflix as well. I just you know, glossed over it for the purpose of time and simplicity, but you're exactly right, so Ivana. Um, yeah, another question here, for example, if we delete hundred records, does it, does it delete file physically? Uh, no, is the short answer, or at least not immediately. Um, and that's fully configurable. So basically what you'll do is because of things like time travel, right? Where you probably want it out of the box, is that um, we will, or Iceberg, any engine that utilizes the Iceberg format will say, all right, I'm gonna go mark these for delete, which is kind of like generally how like MVCC works in general, right? It's like, I'm gonna go mark them for delete, um, but I'm not gonna spend that expensive like delete thing in the, at the current point because the, the most important thing is making that delete operation fast. And so no user, and that no users ever see an inconsistent view of the table, right? Like those are the two main goals of any delete operation. Um, not to say those are the only goals, but then what we can do is once those are, um, basically once those are deleted logically, right? And then what you have is, all right, well, if I go look at the previous version of the table before that delete, like they're still there, 
right? So it gives you the time travel ability, one, but that's very, it's, it's fully configurable. Like if you don't want to keep them around or really more commonly is like, yeah, let's keep them around for like a week and then we can expand it and then be like, all right, well, maybe we do one week for a month, right? Do that kind of tiering approach. Um, you can do that. Like that's fully configurable. Again, like you're the, the end, some engine is actually the one doing the cleanup. So you can absolutely do it that way. And that's something that we see commonly, right? It's like, you don't want to keep every single record of every single file that you deleted forever, right? You want to do some cleanup, but you want to balance that against that trade-off of like, how much data do you want to keep for your time travel and being able to do that logically um, versus storage? And we see a lot of times is like, yeah, the, the storage, especially on cloud data lakes is, is, is generally not the problem uh, at a lower, at not at a lower scale, but like it's generally not the initial problem. Right. Like it's cheap enough where like the benefits that your users get for time travel is worth it to keep those around for some amount of time. Um, if you really wanted to, you could remove them all immediately. Like right when it happens, like you can have something that goes and, and immediately remove them if you really want. Um, but generally what we see more is that kind of tiered approach where, yeah, keep them for a bit and then aggregate it to a single change and then keep that for a week and then, you know, et cetera. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Um, so yeah, I don't know if anybody else has any other questions, but I'm certainly happy to, to stick around and answer any of those. Or Tommy, I don't know if you had anything else you wanted to add. Yeah, well, J Jason, actually, if I could just make a comment, uh, hearing that Hive is now the old standard makes me feel incredibly old. <laughs> yes, maybe we shouldn't use the word old. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Yes, previous. Let's not reference to, you know, relative, uh, yeah, values or just. <clears throat> But do you, yeah. do you mind if I uh, yeah, do you mind if I ask you some questions about yourself? Um, Absolutely. Uh, how did you get into uh, uh, databases? Um, databases specifically. Um, it, originally, I was designing and developing a custom uh, CRM application for uh, a uh, auto dealer in where I grew up in, in Michigan, or actually where I went to school in Michigan. Um, and first we had to build the application. And as soon as that was up and running, the business was like, okay, now we need a lot of analytics. And they were asking me all sorts of questions. Uh, so one, I, uh, that's where I learned a lot about these kinds of things. And like, it was like, why are the queries so slow? And like add one index and all of a sudden everything's blazing fast. Um, so I definitely cut my teeth there as far as, you know, made the mistakes, uh, made the classic DBA mistakes. I'm sure as a lot of us have. Um, but then I got into, then I went off from that to, to Teradata. And actually worked with a lot of, you know, Teradata's customers, you know, the global 2000 and generally large organizations with demanding workloads. Um, so got a lot of, that was really interesting as far as seeing what a lot of customers did. Um, but also I saw that basically everyone wanted off Teradata, <laughs> basically every customer, uh, but they couldn't, right? It was just they, they, nothing else could provide that ability. Um, and that's really why when Dremio reached out to me when I was there, that's why I was really excited about it. It was enabled to, I know we talked about Dremio here, but um, is really the, the ability to provide those kind of data warehousing workloads, which in the past was not possible. Hadoop promised it, but it really didn't fulfill that promise um, of basically being able to really, like truly, we see it all the time with customers, which makes me really excited. I was in the field at Dremio for like two years. Um, and to see the value that they get directly on the data lake without needing to move it into data warehouses is, is I still get excited about it. I think it's really cool. Um, you know, forgive me for, for putting you on the spot here, um, but if okay. you know, I, I find that it, it, it's helpful for, for folks to, to hear from somebody who's been around for a while. Um, like, do you have any advice for, for folks that want to uh, break into, you know, I'm going to call your, your area sort of like a, a, a non-traditional niche of, of data science. Um, any any advice for, for anyone? Do you... Um... Now, I want to be clear on what your question is, so I answer it right. Um, when you say like break into the area that you're talking about is this kind of like uh, more of the business analytics and like data warehousing side, um, of which is like, of course, related to data science. Is that what you mean? Yeah, that, that, is, that is what I mean. Uh, okay. And personally, I, I think of data science as a superset that is sort of like an all-encompassing Borg. So I would. Uh, okay, got it. I'd group you guys. I'd group, you, I'd group this under it. Yeah, fair enough. Um, I think one of the things I tell, so my friends ask me that a lot too. Uh, one of the things that 
I, I think right now is that like a college degree certainly helps. Um, but like, I don't think it's necessary. Like it, to me, like one of the big things is just like go and build something, right? Like to me, it's like, yeah, you can go read stuff and there's a ton of information and you can spend all day reading and there's enough out there. We can learn a lot. Right. Um, but to me, it's really like, we'll, we'll go apply it. Right. And that's where I've always learned the most is like, yeah, this sounds great in theory, but like, let's actually go try it. And it turns out that like, oh, these things that I thought were the case were not. Right. And that's where you learn a lot more. And that's really what a lot of employers value a lot more. Right. Is if like, uh, you, you know, especially if you're even for like an internship, they're like, oh, yeah, like this is kind of stuff I know. It's like, no, no, no I went and built this. And these are the lessons that I learned. And this is how I went about doing it. Like that, that like concrete value driven stuff um, is, I think, really important because especially I mean, the thing is, you know, like data science is super important and super interesting. But, you know, the, the majority of data science projects fail. Right. It's just like we, we, we try it. And like just from an organizational perspective, it's really hard. So to show that you actually went and like provided value and you're actually able to accomplish something and deploy it or whatever. Um, I think like that's that's a differentiator right there between you and the other person. Great. Well, uh, you know, thank you for for giving such a great presentation and, and for uh, letting me put you in the spotlight a little bit at the end without without warning. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> You know, we'd uh, if you're ever out in the DC area, uh, you know, drop drop Jeff or I an email, and we'll uh, uh, you know post you up for a good time. Maybe we'll be able to bring you by an in-person meetup uh, if it's sometime next year. Yeah, no, that sounds great. We'll do. All right, all right. Well, thanks, Jason, and uh, everyone here. Uh, thank you so much. These these events don't happen if if we don't have a, a participating audience, and you guys ask some great questions. So, thanks, everyone. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. So, good night.